Hello everybody, I'm back from our fantastic train holiday. Rond and I had an absolutely unbelievable time. We went to Switzerland, Italy, uh, we passed through Germany, we stayed in France and also Belgium. We had an unbelievable time on some of these glass sided glass top trains through the Alps. It was just unbelievable. Anyway, uh, back to normal on the farm and while I was away, Reuben and Tom, helped by uh, Ian as well, did an absolutely fantastic job on the farm and they managed to get a good lot of the drilling completed, probably 90% of it done, which was a fantastic effort um, from all of them. And there was an awful lot of work to do. It wasn't helped by the weather at the start when I went away with the rain that we had. And so really for them to do all the drilling they did on their own, without me being there just shows I'm not needed but uh, Saturday night they worked through the night this is a week ago now they worked through the night to get a lot of the spraying done and finish the drilling off before the rain started at 10 o'clock on on uh, sorry eight o'clock on the Sunday morning uh, sort of a week ago as now anyway we we have got um, three fields left to to drill we've got two stubble fields that we have got a Claydon direct drill coming I've got uh, one of my relations my cousin or half cousins coming with his Claydon direct drill to uh, to do a demo for us I've wanted to see that for a while and this field behind me here it's 50 acres of sugar beet and we have uh, we have got uh, this to harvest and work and drill we've got the harvester coming here on um, Sunday stroke Monday to lift to lift 20 acres or 25 acres of this field which will be across the far side over there and uh, and then that will go into factory and then we'll lift the rest of this probably in a couple of weeks time the problem we've got at the minute is the factory um, isn't quite running to capacity there's one or two issues and so if we lift all this field and get it all out the ground it will lose sugar and we're still only in sort of the 20th of October time and sugar beet does put an awful lot of weight on in the field in October um, and uh, so we don't want to sort of miss that but on the other hand we need to really be careful of leaving it in the ground too long the weather then turning and then we can't get this field cultivated and planted with uh, with wheat which is what is coming in this field next so it's always a balance when you're growing sugar beet on on heavyish uh, clay soils that we need to lift it early enough to get the crop uh, the next crop in the ground but not too early as to as to damage the yield too much so there is a bit of a, a trade-off but um, we're doing we're doing quite well with the sugar beet um, which I'll touch on that um, uh, uh, shortly now looking at the farm uh, this last week while we've been away because Reuben and Tom uh, have been so busy cultivating odd bits of fields and, and drilling and rolling and spraying and uh, helped by Max as well so our, our, our um, harvest um, uh, chap that we've had uh, our harvest executive, as I've called him, uh, has, has still been here uh, on a part-time basis and helped us with some rolling while we were away. So because they were so busy, I'm afraid there is a shortage of actually videos on the farm this week of machinery running. running. But I have got some um, videos from last year and other times, so I'll do some voiceovers so uh, you'll, you'll get a, a drift and a, and a bit of a um, look at, at how our machines operate. Um, just also, I'd, if I could just touch on one or two points as well uh, regarding the industry. With uh, when we first went away, which is two weeks ago nearly, um, the the pig job wasn't really very good at all, and it still isn't very good. And it's not helped by Boris Johnson really not getting a grasp of, of how uh, the livestock industry works in this country, and uh, doing the damage he, he is doing uh, with with the not allowing um, some of the labour into this country, and also saying that we need to pay more. Uh, for labour over here and we're not going to get ourselves out of jail by, a lot, by allowing cheap labour, uh, cheap foreign labour. Yes, we agree, but the problem we've got is food in this country is too cheap. We are the third cheapest food producer in the world behind America, which is the cheapest, and then Singapore, and we are third. And it's no longer, I don't think, as a tag to be proud of, to be called the third cheapest food in the world. At the moment, the average household only spends around 8% of their weekly budget on food. Now, 
the problem we've got is yes labor um isn't paid enough we do need to pay more for labor but we need to be paying more for our food the way we produce food in this country is not done cheaply it's a highly skilled profession to produce food and this requires uh, requires income and it requires remuneration from us the farmer and the other thing when you start to look at it if you order a say a steak and you have a fillet steak up here in Lincolnshire compared to down in London, it will be probably 50% more in London than here. Yet that steak comes from a cow. That cow is the same price wherever it is. So somebody down in London, down south, is making a lot more money than we are. And, and that clearly isn't right. And, and this is the problem we've got, is that food is way, way too cheap and it needs to be more. It's as simple as that. We've also got the uh, trade deal that's just been struck by um, uh, trade deals just been struck by uh, the government and he made this this uh, there was this video went out on Twitter saying that uh, it's quite a, a laugh really that Boris was making a lot of references to rugby when he was talking to the New Zealand Prime Minister and the, and another thing that's what's happened with the sheep jobs so the whole livestock sector now is being dwindled away by their government that really I just think all they want to do now is they want to import food from the other side of the world which of course increases air miles so really what on earth is going on with with the government and our livestock sector I think they're using our livestock industry as a scapegoat towards net zero and towards climate change which is completely wrong because as always we've said that livestock and farming is not the cause of climate change, it is the solution. Because of all the area of grass and all the other areas of, of ground that livestock graze on is a big carbon sink. The other problem we have is that our MPs do really not understand the countryside. And we have an ideal situation here, an example, where Anne-Marie Trevlin, the International Trade Secretary, said only last night after this trade deal was done with New Zealand, and I'm going to quote it here and read this off my iPad from Twitter. She said, I'm not at all concerned that my Northumbrian lamb farmers will feel at risk. Different seasons in a practical sense because it's the other side of the world. So when I'm eating my Northumbrian lamb at Easter, I wouldn't be eating New Zealand lamb but I might now be able to have some lovely New Zealand lamb for my Sunday lunch in the autumn, which I otherwise wouldn't have had. Now, she obviously doesn't realise that lamb is in season all year round. And when we have our own ministers, our own MPs, she says that she is a rural MP, not understanding the situation with livestock and where the meat comes from and the time of year it's produced. We really are up against it. And this is the big problem we have. The sugar beet you can see being loaded here is from our first field on the heavy clay soils. And uh, this was lifted about three and a half weeks ago. And it's done really well, surprisingly. It's done 89 tonnes per hectare adjusted weight at a sugar content of 18.1%. And the soil tears are really low at only two and a half percent. And this is why we're putting the sugar beet through this cleaner loader. And you can see as the bucket drops the sugar beet into the cleaner, the soil, any loose soil drops through the chains and onto the ground and doesn't go in the lorry because we get penalised if, uh, if we take soil into the factory. So just going back to the yield, the reason why I say adjusted yield, if did 89 tonnes per hectare adjusted, is because we get paid on 16% sugar. So anything over 16% goes towards another tonne of sugar beet. Which, so for us, it's, it's good. It's high sugars are what you want, because it means you're actually not physically taking the sugar beet into the factory, so you're not paying haulage on that high sugar. So we do need high sugar varieties. And I am quite surprised that the sugar is up there as high as that, because you, to get that, you normally need a lot of sunshine and, and hot weather, which of course we didn't get this year. We had August, all that dull, overcast weather. Anyway, we've got another field starting to lift um, this week, and we'll have some more going in the factory then. I've brought Tom and Reuben and Ian 
have a look at the drill filling trailer. We've decided that instead of using hoppers to fill in the drill, we, uh, we need to use something like this. And there aren't many available, and this one is on a farm in Bedfordshire. So we're just coming to have a look at it and see whether we can make anything of it to turn it into a drill filling trailer. See, with our eight meter drill, the auger isn't long enough, so we need to do something with that. But we've got the principle and the design of the hopper and the chassis and everything. The, the thing is that we're using the Manitou so much for loading sugar beet lorries. We are also loading wheat lorries and we're travelling a few miles up the road where the drill is and, and uh, last week it was a real pain because we're having to use the Manitou for three different jobs and fill the drill. So to have something like this that we could park up would be really useful. And uh, the auger, what we would do as well with it is that we'd probably put an, uh, an engine on it so that we could take the tractor off, leave this stud on its own at the end of the field and then the engine would drive an hydraulic auger and, uh, and it would be self-contained unit so that you wouldn't need the tractor or forklift on it. So we'll uh, we'll have a look at it and just have a look inside and just see whether we can whether we can make anything anything of it. At the minute it looks uh, it looks like it's uh, it could suit us. This field is the first field we planted. It was done around the 25th of September, variety called Skyscraper, which is a soft feed wheat. So it can go for, for biscuit making um, as well. Looking quite good. It was planted at 325 seeds a square meter from memory. The only slight issue we've got is that we did have the seed pipes break off on the bottom of the coulters that go in the ground. And you can just see there where Frankie stood um, you can see the effect of that, that there isn't so many plants just in, in that area. Um, but generally there's enough elsewhere. The spring beans will need taking out and um, they'll get done in the next couple of weeks. But we have one or two uh, slug um, problems here, Sm only small at the minute. And uh, looking across the field, um, it's a bit of a job to see where they are because it's not that bad. But there are some dotted around. There we go. You can see some there, how it shreds the leaf just like that and uh, so we will have to put some pellets on if that gets uh, gets out of hand you can see there's some quite significant leaf shredding that's slug damage there and some more there so there is a, a sum in this field it just uh, needs keeping an eye on um, a bit more there as well so it just needs keeping an eye on and if it gets out of hand um, it will have to have an application of, uh, of slug pellets I've got three guys from Lincolnshire Rural Crime Team. Martin Green in uniform, who's currently getting mic'd up, and the other Martin with the camera, and Kev behind getting his drone set up. We do a lot with the local police here to help with rural crime. It is a big issue in Lincolnshire. And on the side of the police vehicle here, we have got Operation Galileo, which is the name, code name, for the hair coursing uh, all over, I think it's over the UK. Martin, is Operation Galileo the UK now? Operation Galileo runs across 24 forces across uh, basic England. And did it start in Lincolnshire? It's Operation Galileo was dreamt up by Lincolnshire Police. Look yeah. at that. Right place. at the forefront, yet again, Lincolnshire. So Martin's getting his fluffy one on his lapel already. Testing, <laughs> 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 testing. And the other Martin's getting ready to, I don't know, what are you going to do with that, Martin? Where's that going? Where's this going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Crikey, look at this drone. Now that is a drone and a half. So just to show you the size, that is my foot. Can we do a bit of crop spraying with this? Right. That'd be good that, put a tank on it. So just out of interest, Kev, what's the price of that, please? Uh, these are uh, 30 some thousand pounds. They, they carry thermal um, imaging camera on them. Right, so, uh, 30,000? Yeah, uh, it flies for an hour. Yeah. Uh, so bear in mind that's the initial investment, but after that initial investment, then obviously it's just the cost of charging the batteries, yeah. which uh, will last for an hour, so we carry four batteries, um, which are an hour each. How much hour is that? It's got a fair old weight, that is. It is, yeah. Yeah. 
it's quite a serious, obviously quite a serious commercial aircraft. So, yeah. Uh, it does daylight and thermal imaging. And do you have to have special training and, and, and Absolutely. for that? And First of all, we train to um, uh, a civil aviation standard. Yeah. Uh, so all our guys are trained to that standard initially. That gives them eff effectively, if you like, their permissions. So we can call it a license. Technically, it's not, but the permissions. And then after that, um, we go on to give them differences training. So an extra three days on this aircraft. Yeah. Just to give them a chance to get used to it, all its functions. It's a big aircraft um, and it's quite complex. Uh, so we've got all different colour palettes on the thermal camera obviously the daylight camera and just give them a, a, a few days training to give them a chance to operate it and, and wow. around. Wow, brilliant. Tim's having his uh, photo taken. Looking very official. Good guy, Martin. I've known him probably 20, 25 years. Just having a run around what uh, these guys have got strapped to them all the time. Just out of interest, what does one of these weigh? Oh, Look at the, with yeah. The, with the vest. yeah, yeah, and so, so what? What's this one here? You were saying that one's Pava. That's the incapacitant spray. Yeah. Wow. And it makes so you, and, and you get not six seconds worth of spray out of that. Yeah. And that will aim it at the face, and that will incapacitate you. Your eyes will uh, will stream. Your nose will stream. Your mouth. Oh, nice. Your face will burn, but it doesn't have long-lasting effect. Right. So it's a short term. Uh, incapacitant spray. Right, what else have we got here then? Handcuffs and battens. So there's the baton. So that extends out. Wow, yeah, keep out of the way of that. Yeah. To be fair, we don't use those very often. And then obviously, we've got our oh, rigid yeah. cuffs as well, which are all set up ready. So they're on the ratchet, ready to, to go. So oh, you can whip them on quickly. Rigid. Yeah, cuffs. yeah. And then. Uh, body one video, of course. Really oh, so, so that's uh, there to protect everybody. It protects us. It protects. Uh, and is that that's actually recording now? Is it? it? So what happens in the background? It records on a loop. So to trigger it, we press yep. it twice, twice, and then that will give us a previous recording from the time we set beforehand as well. And is that relayed back to back to base? No, that's just for us. Right. And we can view that, and right. that can be used later. Yeah. Um, afterwards. Right. Um, beyond that, obviously, we carry things like spare radios, torches, spare radio batteries, yeah. power radio torches. And uh, leg restraints as well. Right, yeah. So um, if we've got somebody who's really kicking off and they're using their legs as, uh, as a weapon against us, then that's when the leg restraints look well. out. We also then carry uh, the spit guards yeah. as well, yeah. um, along with gloves, and we've got some first aid elements so oh, for right. resus. Um, so Need some more gloves. Yeah. Spit, spit hood. Yeah. Been lots guards, of lots of spit guards, guards, right? Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, bad press uh, put out about these, but at the end of the day, if you're spitting at somebody, yeah. you should have one of these yeah. in place. Yeah. Because spitting isn't very, very nice for no. police officers or anybody else. And some people have hepatitis yeah. and various other yeah. diseases, so we really don't need it to protect us against those, those diseases. Mm. Very, very rarely ever used, are they? Very rare. You know, I assume mm. you haven't used They're a last them. resort. Mm. Brilliant, Same thanks. Pattern, last resort. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, so we'll see that. Brilliant. So is it is it just used out in the countryside then, out in the rural areas? It is mainly. So uh, kind of the number one usage for this that we found years now as a drone team and the number one use we've found is high risk people. Right. So uh, anybody that goes wandering off, um, you know, anybody wants, anyone suffering from mental health uh, or maybe Alzheimer's, it's great, we can put the aircraft out. Um, we still use the helicopter, the helicopter is a resource we can use but this just allows us to get an aerial asset on scene very quickly. Yeah. Our helicopter comes from a distance away, it takes time to get to us and it might just be that we can find that first before we need the helicopter. Yeah, please. Yep. <laughs> so we're going to bring this in now to land. And the wind is very strong, probably 25 miles an hour, so it is a bit tricky, but it is quite a heavy, large drone. Great job there in this wind. Look at that steady 
easy as anything. Assisted by GPS, of course, and the technology is on board. We've got quite a lot of technology on there. That aircraft shut down now. about to fly this large drone that's got heat seeking cameras on them as well. Here's the control. So as you can see that's the uh, wind's about 25 miles an hour today. That's holding nicely in that strong wind using that GPS. Incredible that because it is a very strong wind. It is moving around a little bit but it will. So we'll just do our after takeoff checks just making sure all the controls are moving in the right direction. So what particular, uh, what range will this go from you? So we fly line of sight, so we're looking to fly line of sight which will uh, mean that that's generally going to be within 500 pieces of the large aircraft on there but it's well over. Yeah. Usually within 500 pieces but as emergency service we've got exemptions. So with this aircraft we can fly up to 200. So certainly, uh, you know, if it's high risk missing person in a rural area, camera so as you can see if you uh, can see on there we've got the daylight camera on at the moment and what we get is blue circles for anything that moves so if there's somebody walking through the field that would track them that would show us they've turned on one of those blue circles yeah we can then switch to our thermal imaging camera so we can switch to thermal imaging there so if we just bring the aircraft round to point that towards us we should you will see ourselves on that thermal imaging camera so bring the aircraft around pointing it towards where we are and then just bring the angle of the camera up and I don't know if you can see that. And can you see the white yeah, spots the white, there? Yeah, spots. So that's us on the thermal imaging camera. I'm also able to go picture in picture as well, so I can put the daylight on. So what I'm able to do is zoom on the daylight to see what that thermal image is that I'm looking at. Yes. So you that. can see the picture in picture there. And with that, I can just zoom in. I can see that there's two people stood there. So that heat source. Wow. But you know, it's really good to use the heat source initially to pick that up. So if there's any deers, rabbits, we'd even pick up that level of detail with the camera. Yeah, so, yeah. This is the second field that we've planted and it was done 11 days ago. It's a variety called Skyscraper. It's on our light heathland. The previous crop last year was oats, was spring oats. And so there's an awful lot of straw and you can just see this crop is coming through. You can just see there the sprigs of wheat. So it's just nice to start. Yes, thank you, I know, hello. <laughs> um, you could just see the sprigs of wheat there just started to come through, but we've also got some oats as well um, that have been shed from the combine, but they'll be easy to control in this, in this wheat. So in another few days, uh, this will look quite good, this field. So um, I'll be pleased with this, but we were going to direct drill this field straight into um, the oats and oat straw. But again, with our free flow drill, having so many tines in it, uh, it was blocking up. So we had to put the express across it lightly, which is the light discs, which you saw last week. But just to remind you, this was the machine, but we had to put that across it just to get the soil and the straw mixed up. And this is the problem with our free flow drill. But the other problem here is this soil is really light and fluffy. It's got very low clay content, unlike our other land but it's got high sand content, but it is very loose and fluffy and it does push up in the machinery quite easily. But it is something we're aware of. We need to look at it, um, but I'm just a bit loath to spend 100, 150,000 pounds on a, on a new drill. We're just applying some glyphosate to this field that we haven't planted yet. You can see the volunteer wheat that's growing all this needs to be killed before we put the next crop in the ground so we're just applying 2.7 liters per hectare of glyphosate which of course this is a really environmentally friendly product it means we don't have to cultivate the soil to kill the weeds which is very difficult to do anyway especially this time of year when there's lots of moisture and when you see that sprayer running 
just remember that is not all chemicals or plant protection products. That's applied in 100 litres of water. So at 2.7 litres per hectare of glyphosate, we're applying 97.5 litres of water. So 97.5% of what you can see in that sprayer now is water. So when you see a sprayer working in a field, don't be alarmed thinking the amount of damage that might be happening to the environment and to nature, because it's not. And when we uh, apply products to crops that are growing, it's no different to you going to the doctors when you're not feeling very well. You go to the doctors for some tablets or to see if you can get some help or some antibiotics. And what we apply to the crops is no different. We're just making the crops better. So this particular plot here is uh, where Agri are going to establish their trial plots and that's happening this next week which we'll show you that in next week's update so all these are going to be little plots here with different varieties in for different treatments uh, to uh, to see for our open days which we'll have um, in the spring and summer next year and then across here on the stubble i have got a claydon direct drill coming it's a uh, relative of mine half cousin i think he is um and we're going to direct drill straight into this uh, into this stubble as a trial to just to see what the drill's like. We're trying different drills all the time. So uh, here we're going to go straight into that stubble there and just see. It's quite it, um, a heavy soil. It's probably 50% clay and uh, interesting to see how it goes. But it's in good condition, this soil is. We've done the outsides with a low disturbance subsoiler there because it was there was some compaction. So we've done that and we'll see what this drill's like. So this clip isn't this year's drilling, it's last autumn's, but this is the free flow drill we use. We've had it about six years, it's eight meters wide. We bought it second hand, but it is really, really good on these heavy clay soils. It puts the seed in exceptionally well, and the seeds are very constant depth. And we've had uh, three free flows now with this eight meter, We've had a six meter and also a 4.5 meter a few years ago. This clip is of the uh, free flow drilling on our light heath soils and it's from last spring but it just shows you how different our soil types are and uh, but, but how good this drill is uh, in, in the two situations. This particular clip we were direct drilling into, uh, we we're drilling oats into the ground straight after cover crop and sheep had grazed it and uh, it went in actually exceptionally well. But uh, great drill and uh, it does put the seed in exception well at a good depth. So we're rolling these oats that were drilled three days ago. That's before. And that's after. There's no rain forecast, so thought we'd better just try and conserve the moisture here to help the crop germinate. 12 meter wide Dalbo rolls, and the tractor is a case 225 CVX, so 225 horsepower. Tractor's about 10 years old. Got dual wheels all around to help with the reduced compaction and just keep the tractor on top better. 
obviously with this transmission it only puts the revs of the tractor at the load it requires so we haven't got many revs on which obviously helps with the fuel consumption which with this outfit is 1.8 litres per hectare It's uh, Wednesday evening and Rhonda and I have been invited to Lincoln Cathedral. Fantastic building you can see behind, we'll have a look at that in a minute. There is a harvest supper in, uh, when is it? Next week? Sunday. And Sunday and this is, a, this is a dinner we've been invited to with an auction uh, of raffle at the end and it's to raise money for the outreach um, centre point which is uh, to help the homeless people in Lincoln. So there should be a um, good evening here tonight, lots of people here and hopefully raid lots of money for a really good cause. So this is Lincoln Cathedral here, an absolutely unbelievable building. And when I was at school, I was at school only just across the road from here, used to come here regularly, have services here and um, sing in the choir as well and all sorts. It's a stunning building. And the cathedral was, I think, started to be built in 1072 and it was finished in 1311. And at that point, it held the record for the tallest building in the world. And that happened and kept that um, title until something like 1538 or something in that area. So it held the record for the tallest building in the world for 238 years and it actually still holds the record for the tallest building in the world for the longest period of time, which is absolutely phenomenal. So yeah, fantastic building here and uh, something that we're really proud of in Lincoln and the event tonight will be a really, really good and hope to raise lots of money for a very, very worthwhile cause. So this is the organisation that we're raising money for tonight and there's actually uh, some of here's some of the uh, food and offerings that's been brought but we cut down a lot um, this year we're going to do at the harvest supper when we actually sorry what the service when we have it a week on Sunday so here we are yeah well so Jenny Gorgeous, red. I have known for about 25 years. Is that or maybe more than that? Oh, 30, right, okay, that's showing our age now. And uh, we're all at this fantastic function not to raise money for this incredible organisation. There are large areas with no fresh food available at all. People who can least afford it are stuck in a junk food cycle, which is affecting their health and prospects. And this reliance on ultra-processed cheap food has major environmental impacts too. I've been working very closely with the Lincolnshire Food Partnership, which is an umbrella group of organisations striving for greener, fairer, healthier food for all. So I got a nice little surprise when I got back from our train holiday. A hamper here from Omex Fertilisers. So we'll open it and have a look what's inside. I did a bit of uh, um, filming for them and a bit of help with some promotion work uh, on the benefits of liquid fertiliser over solid fertiliser. And what we've got here. Dear Andrew, many thanks for participating in our Growing with Omex video series and helping to educate growers on liquid fertilisers. All the best, Omex. Very kind of you, thank you. Oh, what have we got here? A lot of straw by the look of it, all the packing, waistcoat, and all oh, some goodies in here. You can't beat Piper's Chris sweet chili. They are delicious. There's all sorts underneath here. Gingerbread, what else have we got? Lots of Lincolnshire plum bread. Wow. Yeah, so everything from here is in Lincolnshire. So thank you, Omex. That's really good of you and only too happy to help. It's great having the partnership with you that we do. Thank you.